All right, we're going to take a look at a center of mass problem where we're trying to find the center of mass for a rod, and that uh, density of that rod is changing. Uh, these problems are always, I think, a little more simple. When you have a rod of uniform density, and if you choose one end to be zero, and you got the rod of length L, as long as there's uniform density, it's pretty easy. You have a gut level feel right where that center of mass is going to be, in the middle of the rod. And the problem we had on a little multiple choice test uh, was asking about the center of mass on a rod, and the density of that rod changed as you went from uh, one end all the way out to the full length. And it's pretty easy if you're given a selection of answers like you see there, to y you know right away that the center of mass is not going to be at zero. You, not, it, you know it's not going to be at uh, uh, choice E or F. Uh, e is right there on the end of the bat. F, that's way out beyond the bat, uh, three-halves the length L. So you can quickly eliminate A, E, and F. Um, if you know that the density is increasing as you move from uh, one end of the bat to the full length, you know that it's not going to be B, you know that it's not going to be C because that's what you get whenever you have a bat of uniform density, and that leaves you with one choice, D. And look out for those problems that you can solve just by intuition. Well, what if we didn't just have intuition and we needed to go through and do some calculations? We're going to do this, but first we're going to go back to that gut level problem. Uh, even though it's real obvious, I think it's worth taking a look at and seeing how we can use a little bit of our calculus skills to answer the question, where is the center of mass when you have a rod of uniform density length L? Well, we know that uh, in general, the center of mass is found by taking all of the little teeny chunks of matter, and we designate that with dm, and we look at how far they are from uh, our reference point zero, and we indicate that with x, and you add all of those up from zero all the way out to the length of the rod of uniform density, and you divide that, the product of all of those, by the total mass. Uh, well, we've got uh, some interesting issues here regarding some of our variables, though. Uh, we know that if we have uniform density, uh, the mass of the entire thing you can find by just taking the entire length and multiply it by lambda. Lambda is a special uh, variable that we call linear density. I'm sure you guys are all uh, familiar with volumetric density. Uh, in your chemistry class, you've calculated how many grams per cubic centimeter uh, some substance has. Well, we're just saying that let's take this concept linear density and we'll uh, answer the question just how much mass something has by looking at the total length and knowing what the uh, overall density is of the material that makes up that rod. Now I want to caution you, remember this only works if we have a uh, rod of uniform linear density. Well, rather than uh, take a look at the whole rod, what if we took a look at it? one little chunk and we would designate that chunk as a chunk of thickness dx, you can see that indicated on the top, and we would also indicate the mass of that chunk with dm. If you want to visualize this, think of a big uh, long tube of salami, and we're going to cut off a little uh, teeny uh, disc of salami that has some thickness dx. Well, we're describing that little mass, dm, as being equal to dx times lambda. Well, what are we going to do with this? We know what the, the way is for describing the center of mass. That's that integral that we see up on the very top. And instead of writing dm, we're going to write what we can substitute for dm, and that's dx lambda. I have brought the two constants, lambda and the total mass, out in front of the integral sign. And we're left with the easiest integral that you guys ever evaluate in your calculus class. Uh, we've got the integral of x dx, which is, of course, x squared over 2. Evaluate that from 0 to L. And you get lambda over 2m times L squared. Well, wait a second. That doesn't really tell us that the center of mass is located one half the length of the rod. 
Well, let's see if we can do just a little bit more with the variables that we have. We've got lambda, the linear density, and we've got that mass down there. Um, all of those variables are hiding something. What we can do is we can say to ourselves, we know what lambda is. It's the total mass of that rod divided by the total length. That's what we describe as linear density. And we're dividing that by 2m times L squared, which reduces down to L over 2. We've located the center of mass for that rod of uniform density as being placed right at one half its length. Well, what if density varies as a function of distance from the end of the rod? Now, the multiple choice question that I had given you uh, gave a little more obscure function for describing this. I'm going to clean this up. I found this in your textbook. And we're going to say lambda is equal to uh, a times x. And all that saying is, uh, for example, when you're at x equals 0, the density is 0. And you go all the way out to the end of your bat, and the density is going to be a times l. Uh, snuggled away inside that variable a are all the characteristics that are going to give us the density. And of course, as you can see, there's a linear relationship between, or a direct relationship between, uh, where we are from 0 all the way out to L and how we describe that density. The density is increasing in a linear fashion. Well, we know that a little teeny chunk of that rod can be described as the small thickness dx times lambda. Oops, except now lambda is not constant. So we can't do what we formerly did. We just said, oh, dm is equal to dx times lambda. Now we're going to say dm is equal to, and yeah, it's still uh, you know, dx times lambda, except lambda is changing. Lambda is described as ax. And so we just go ahead and make some more substitutions. We are going to take the integral. We're adding up all those little teeny infinitesimally thin chunks of matter from 0 all the way out to the end of our rod. That's from 0 to L. And instead of writing x dm over m, we are going to write x dm, except dm becomes ax dx. We bring our constants out in front of the integral sign. That's a, whatever that happens to be, divided by the total mass of the rod. And you can see that we're going to evaluate this definite integral from 0 all the way out to the end of it. And we have probably the second uh, uh, function that you ever integrated in a calculus class, x squared dx. And that evaluates as a x cubed over m divided by 3. And we do that from 0 to l. Evaluate that from uh, 0 all the way out to length l. And we end up with the center of mass is a times the length cubed divided by 3m, which doesn't look too pretty. And again, snuggled away inside those variables are some, uh, some things that we can simplify. Uh, key to simplifying this is expressing the mass. How can we express the total mass of our rod in terms of its length? So the question is, what about m? Well, you know that the total mass of that rod is going to be uh, the addition of all the little teeny infinitesimally thin uh, pepperoni slices from 0 all the way out to L. And we're going to make another substitution. We've described those little thin uh, small pepperoni slices, dm, in terms of their thickness. And that's where we get the ax dx. Again, evaluate that very simple integral, and you end up with al squared over 2. So we now know that the mass of our rod is a, whatever that coefficient is, times the length of the rod squared divided by 2. Well, now we make another substitution. We formally had uh, uh, calculated that the center of mass was al cubed over 3m. Well, let's substitute for m what we now know m to be in terms of the length. So we end up with 2 thirds L. And we locate the center of mass up on that top drawing 
uh, with that little red dot. And I've tried to illustrate the idea of increasing density by increasing the density of the shading. I uh, hope that helps you out, and it's good to have a gut level understanding of what the answers are. But we also need to learn how to apply our calculus skills to some of these physics problems as well. This is a great e example of applying some uh, real simple calculus skills to a simple little physics problem.